Okay, we're now back for our final, final, final session. The very end of our sessions. I want to put on the board here. Uh, I don't have this in your notes exactly like this. So on the back of your one of your pages, if you could write this, this chart, and put on the board physical and spiritual. Again, we already we already established in previous lessons that there is a spiritual realm, the realm of soul, the realm of mind, non non material. So we have a physical dimension and a, spir- and a spiritual dimension of reality. Let's use the words now personal and personal. Where would you put in, in general placement the, the term impersonal? Which side of our chart? Spiritual. Impersonal. Physical. Yeah, wouldn't impersonal usually be in the physical side? Why? What's an example of impersonal that's physical? Particles and rocks. Okay, rocks. How about electricity? Is that physical? Yeah. Uh, electricity is physical. Chemical, uh, anything that has gas, dust, and liquid is physical. So gas, dust, and liquid. So electricity has gas, at least. Isn't electricity charged gas? Gas that's highly charged? Clouds are gas and what? What are clouds made of? Gas and what else? Water. Liquid. Okay. And um, of course, earth is dust or a combination of dust, air, and liquid. So anything dust, air, and liquid is, is physical, but it's impersonal. It's impersonal. Gas is impersonal, and liquid's impersonal. But we have personal things in this room. Us. So we have personality. So where does that go in general? Physical or spiritual? Because how would you describe the term personality? What's the definition of personality? Okay, mind, emotion, will. Is that a physical thing? Are emotions physical? Can you see, again, Kant, Kant would say, can you see anger? You can't see it. You can't find anger in your blood tissue. You can't find anger in your muscles, your bones. Anger is not in the physical body. But something gets angry. We call that the person. But that person's not blood tissue or bone, so it's not physical, it's spiritual. So here we have the personal side. So again, we're persons, and if light comes from light, that means that there's someone personal who allowed us to come into existence since we are not eternal beings. And that means that we have a dimension. The the part that makes us personal is spiritual and we come from something before us that's original. So we have to come from an original personal spiritual being that's also good. We call that God. So here's an example of impersonal physical Gravity is a physical force. Gravity is a physical force. Can you think of a spiritual, personal, moral force? Love. 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 What else? What? What's? What do Muslims really uh, look look for when a person steals something? Justice. Justice. So, most cultures would have no hesitation to say, we believe in justice. Some cultures might be lacking in love. In fact, if you look at Islamic culture, uh, you don't find as much love there as in other cultures, but you do find justice. Now, in American culture, you might find a lot of love, especially free love, in the sexual sense, but maybe not as much justice. So, every culture has uh, an imbalance toward one thing or another, but you can find justice is one example. What were you saying, Carlos? They think that's still how the morality is. Justice? Justice, yeah. Yeah, some cultures 
that on top of their list as a priority. But just for example, for our class, we'll call, as, a, as an example, justice. Now, is justice a physical thing? No. Yeah, you'll never find it under a microscope. Uh, it's an invisible thing. Okay, well, how can you believe in God? Isn't that the same as an invisible gardener? Uh, and, and in other words, isn't that no better than no gardener at all? Isn't an invisible gardener just the same thing as saying there's no gardener? But then ask that person, can you see justice with your five senses? No. But do you believe in justice? And if you, again, if you burn down the house of Anthony Flew in his former life, and he was an atheist, he would want justice. And he would say, but Mr. Flew, justice is no different than no justice. It's just the same as nothing. It's not real. But he would not agree to that. He would say, no, justice is real. But it's not material, Mr. Flew. It's immaterial. It's invisible. But yet you believe in it and you want it. You want to see it happen in your life. You want justice. So this is a good balance here. Physical, spiritual. Impersonal, personal. Gravity, justice. Now, gravity. Does gravity have choices? Does gravity make choices? No. It just what? Just happens. Just happens. Just is. So in philosophy, we call this the principle of is. But on this side, what would you put in place as a parallel to is? Well, does could be in both sides. You could say gravity does something or uh, justice does bring satisfaction. But... There is, in philosophy, there is a parallel between is and something else. Choice. Okay, choice, but people should choose a certain way, we would say in this side. Uh, for example, justice. Justice demands that a certain choice be made. That blank be done. That blank be done. What's the blank? Justice. Should or ought. Okay, so this is called is ought. The is ought... Comparison. Oughts go over here and is's go over here. For example, if you burn down the house of Mr. Flu, what might he say? That ought not be the way. That ought not be, be done. You ought not have done that. You should not have done that. Okay, that means he's appealing. He's appealing to some law. There's some law of oughtness that ought not be done. That's not right, and he knows that instinctively. So that's ought. But gravity, could you ever say to gravity, you shouldn't have done that? Gravity, you ought not have done. What right do you have? It just is. When it comes to physical things, they just are. That's it. When it comes to moral things, there's ought and ought not. We also call this in philosophy the category of fact. Can you think of what this is called over here? Personal beings have the ability to assign something to facts. Value. Value. Life is full of values. But values are not physical things. Now, I told you yesterday there's a book by Arthur Holmes. Can anybody here recall the title of that book? There, 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 Two thirds of that title are up here on the board. The book is titled Fact, Value, God. How do you come up with God based upon fact and value? How do you think his book makes its argument? There's something ahead of fact and value. Does the world have facts in it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. This floor is here. It, it just is. This floor is, is a floor. That's a fact. Now, 
Who says that this floor is good or bad? Can the floor by itself, an impersonal particle, can the floor give a value to itself? Does that even make sense? No, floors don't think and floors don't evaluate. They just hang out. They just are. So something that's not a floor has to give a value to it. I like this floor. It's got great color. It's kind of bouncy. It makes me higher than you, so I can look down on you. Wow, I like it. Someone else says, no, I don't value this floor. I like being down with the, with the common people, the common students. So. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah, we assign values. So, how does that get us to the level of God? You know, how does, how does this uh, dimension here give us a moral lawgiver? Well, uh, Lewis? In order to assign a value, um, yeah, this a second ago. The standard? We, now, in order for us to assign the standard, assign value, uh, we also must have a conception of value. If you go back far enough, you'll find that God is the original conception of value. Yeah, now, now this, this floor example is a bad example for what I want to say now. Let, let's use a more universal example. Um, killing our own mothers. Okay? Um, now, when a, when a mother's killed, is that a fact or a value? Yeah. It's a fact. Okay, when a mother's killed, it's a, it, that's an is. That mother is dead. Okay? The fact is, uh, Johnny Blue killed that mother. That's a fact. Okay, now, I know there are some cuckoo people out there, but, you know, for most people, how would they value that, that fact and that is? Most people. Okay, ought not. That ought not have been done. That was wrong. Okay, now, that's, that's a universal or 99.9% .9 universal uh, value held by us. Now, once again, we are not eternal. We are created. We are contingent. We are dependent. So, where did we... Uh, if we are just random particles, if we are people who make up our own values, like some, some of the books say uh, to, today in schools, if we're, if we're inventing our own values, then what should be the percentage of those who favor killing mothers versus those who don't? 50 /50. should be kind of a 50-50. Half the world thinks killing mothers is a good thing and half thinks it's not. But it's not that way. It's almost 100%. That's not right. But is there floating above our heads some, some uh, physical law that... See, right there it says in the, in the heavens, uh, don't kill your mother. Is there some kind of a physical book floating in the air that, that makes us know this? No. Where do we know this? What's it called? It's a C word in English. How, yeah, we know by our con we have a guilty conscience or an innocent conscience. Our conscience tells us instinctively that killing mothers is wrong. But where does the conscience come from? We didn't create a conscience. From a standard. There has to be a conscience, uh, just as our bodies, at least Adam and Eve, or the one cell germ, whatever is the first living thing, that thing, it was not eternal, it was not non-contingent, it was contingent, so that one cell germ has to come from something that's not a one cell germ, and we have to come from something that's not us. But whatever produced us has to be moral, and that's where, because, and that's where the source of morality comes from. So, so fact and value do lead to God. Because you have to have, again, the idea of universe, you have to have one boss, ultimately. One thing that's the standard. You have to have one single standard or you have chaos. But our world does not have chaos except for the elements of sin and perversion. But the original good, the non-chaos, that's part of our original planet, has to have a single source for making it a universe. So you end up with one God. One God to explain the uni part of universe. And that one God must be spirit, personal, moral, and so forth. So this chart, I think, is very helpful to, to make it clear to people how to evaluate reality using these arguments we've been going through step by step.
Okay, look on your handout. We have to spend a little bit of time responding to the problem of evil. Now, let me test you again. This is kind of a repeat. One of the arguments against uh, the teleological argument that, that life has order and design is, they would say, you can also find in life lots of what? Disorder. disorder. You find lots of disorder and chaos. Okay, so once again, I, I, want you, I want to test you here. How can you respond to that using Augustine? Sure, you do find chaos. You do find disorder. But how can Augustine help us here regarding our previous discussion? Yeah, what does disorder depend on? Order. Order. Chaos depends on order or non chaos. You have to have something to mess up. And the thing that you're messing up before you messed it up was not messed up. It was good. So, so again, evil actually is on our side in terms of apologetics. When, when, people, when people say that's evil, you can say that proves God. Look, look at our hand out here. Evil actually proves God. Look at the one, two, three, four, fourth paragraph under J.P. Moreland. The fourth paragraph under J.P. Moreland. Where it says external problem of evil. Go to the near the bottom of that paragraph. In parenthesis, I have this A, B, C, D. Do you see that? Lowercase a. It says there, if God did not exist, then objective type, or as they call it, gratuitous, which means meaningless or senseless evil, as they say, those kinds of values and morals would not exist. In other words, if, if there is no God, no moral lawgiver, if there is no God at all in the universe, no moral God, then is it a case of anything goes? Are we free to do what we want? <coughs> no one to account to. Would that mean we could do whatever we want? Yeah. So that there would be no objective morality. And yet there is objective morality. We established that yesterday. There is objective morality. But they're saying here, or uh, Moreland and Craig are saying here, that if God did not exist, then there would not, not be any objective morality. But B says, like I just said, there is objective type. Gratuitous evil. And evil is a moral issue. So when Larry King says, well, are you sure there's a God? Because there's evil in this world. He just made an absolute statement. There's evil. He, he knows, there, he didn't say, well, maybe there's evil. Is there evil? He said, there is evil. I don't like it. That means that Larry King, people like that, believe in objective evil. Evil is what kind of an issue? In what category do discussions of evil take place? Theological, Theological or? What, what's our topic today? Moral. Morality. Is evil a moral issue? Yes, okay, so when a person says, how do, you know, how do I know God exists? Because that, that dam broke last week and everybody drowned. That was evil. How can God exist? They just proved He existed. How, how do they just prove it? Because they had a good dam. <laughs> do they believe in evil? Yeah. The people who complain about evil? Yeah. They believe in evil. Is it a, an objective uh, thing to them? That evil exists objectively? Yes. Not just their opinion, but it, it just is evil, period. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a moral issue, right? Mm -hmm. Is morality physical or spiritual? It's spiritual. it's spiritual. Back to our chart again. Those who say that ought not have happened, that's wrong. They just prove by their words, their own mouth, that they agree. They might not realize they agree, but their statement shows they believe in spiritual things. Because evil is not a physical thing. It's, it's a moral thing, an invisible thing. And it's an absolute thing. And how do we know what ought and ought not be? Uh, and why is it that we all have the same idea? 
When, if you talk to every person on planet Earth about uh, how they feel, how they value that dam breaking and killing all the apart from a few cuckoo heads, most people, 99.9% would say, is it good or bad? Bad. Bad. So just, like, just like killing mothers. So there's some knowledge of a thing so consistent. What do you call things that are so consistent? Laws. Laws. Like gravity. We call them laws. And these laws are consistent. And they all point to... When you say consistent, you're saying that there's a oneness. Consistency means oneness. So that you all point to one source. One standard. That means that this one God is the standard to measure right or wrong. That dam bursting is wrong and killing mothers is wrong and it all comes back ultimately to one source, one God, who's, who happens to be good. A good source. And again, good is first, evil is second. So he must be good. He cannot be evil. So, keep following our argument here. So let, let's kind of go back again. A, if God did, did not exist, then objective type or gratuitous morals or values would not exist. But B, we already know that objective type, gratuitous or non-gratuitous evil exists. Everybody knows there's evil. They all recognize it and complain about it. Therefore, C, objective type moral values exist, such as evil, which is a moral value, an objective value. Therefore, that actually proves God does exist. Now, this argument is, is uh, given more detail in apologetics than it is here. It's also simplified. But there is a basic argument that makes sense. That the complaint about evil itself is a recognition of absolute evil. That evil is an absolute thing. And it's always bad. Evil is always considered a bad thing. It's, it's given the value of a bad thing. And that points to a universal knowledge of morality that comes from one single source. That's why it's always a consistent uh, value among humans. And it points back to God. Okay, next handout. We have to rush along here. save time for our last page so we'll kind of go through this kind of just run through it now I keep repeating certain things because I think I believe in that principle of repetition if you keep hammering a nail it eventually goes in so I'm hoping if I keep hammering the similar ideas they'll eventually come in deeper and deeper Either you're getting more and more confused or more and more enlightened. I hope it's the last thing, but I'll keep hammering away here. Okay, top of the page, Arthur F. Holmes, the author of this book, The Fact Value God, just as kind of a wrap up regarding his his excuse me, his view. Look at the third line from the bottom, where it says good in quotation marks. Good has to have a fixed standard explanation in order for it to be consistently understood. Once again, if we use our bus example yesterday from uh, Peru to Brazil, if there was no universal standard of good, you would not know what to do about anything. Every day would be full of question marks. Can I eat that food in this country? Maybe this country uh, believes that food should have gasoline in it. That, that, that's good. That's, that's her definition of good. Um, Maybe I can't drive a car because driving a car is illegal in Brazil because they, they, don't, they think that's an evil thing. You know, let's get into all kinds of insanity with these examples. But how do we know if wherever we go, wherever we, uh, whatever we do, that there is a reliable standard of good? How can we function in the civilized world if there's no agreement about what good and evil is? And there usually is agreement. 
So he says, it has to have a fixed standard. That's what C.S. Lewis was saying in Mere Christianity. And a creator God is the best candidate. There's no, there's no other explanation that, that competes as well as the answer is that one does. Therefore, creational facts are connected to creational values, morals, which are ultimately connected to a creator God. So I spent my earlier is getting at. This is a quick glimpse without explaining very much. Okay, now, I told you earlier under the category of additional thoughts that there's a renaissance of various classical views. Look at this first paragraph under additional thoughts. The classical arguments for God's existence still have strong support today. The ontological argument is promoted by Alvin Plantinga that we looked at earlier. Number two, the cosmological argument is now John Warwick Montgomery. Number three, the teleological argument is being promoted with great success by William Dembski. Number four, the moral or axiological argument has been promoted for a long time by C.S. Lewis, Arthur Holmes, Moreland and Craig, Peter Kreeft, and Paul Chamberlain. That's the most popular argument of all time, probably the moral argument. Now, this is outside of our class. Our class is philosophy, but we could also add number five, Christological arguments such as his resurrection which we spent time on in apologetics and number six the biblical argument that the Bible has evidence of being not from just people only it has profound incredible uh, future prophecies and fulfillments and things that cannot be explained from typical humans as the, sor as the sole source so any and all of these offer strong support for the objective basis for morality in God. So there really is a renaissance going on with those classical arguments being uh, reused and given fresh, fresh treatment. Now I haven't said much more about answering the problem of evil. But that would require a lot more time than we can give to that. So what I gave you earlier uh, is a, just a very um, surface treatment of the problem of evil as, in terms of a response. But just, just very quickly, uh, before we go on in this page, what would you say are some responses as to why evil occurred? If God is all-powerful and all-good, why do you think he allowed evil? Contrast. Ultimately, for his glory. Mm -hmm. Okay, how give, give, give the best example that there is for how evil glorifies him. Well, we are evil creatures. We come to Christ, and by this salvific process, God is glorified because of his grace. Okay, but by the fact that we're in trouble, we're in sin, and we receive grace, we glorify him as a gracious God. But... Even, I mean, this is, this is connected to what I'm, what I'm getting, what, what I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, another example that still is related to that. Um, without evil, you don't have who coming to earth. Okay, you don't have God becoming man without evil. I mean, why should he waste his time becoming man and suffering if there's no evil? Mm -hmm. So because there is evil, he came here and suffered and rose again, and now he's glorified. So... This ties in with God's glory. One purpose of evil is to glorify God. Now, let me give you a philosophical possibility. This is in your notes in the previous page, but I'll just tell it to you orally or, or for the camera's sake. It's on your notes before this. And this is, this is a philosophical speculation. But see if this makes sense to you. Let's, let's imagine we're back uh, with God, that we're somehow a viewer of God before He created anything. So it's just God, the way God was from all eternity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God alone, self-existent, and uh, He's you know, perfectly... Um, he, he's self-sustaining. Self um, he's, he's complete, okay? Now, do you think that God had the conception of evil in His mind? Did, did God have the knowledge of good and evil? Yes, he did. Yes. Now, he is good. So, of course, he knows what he is. He's good. What he is is good, and what good is is what he is. 
But do you think he had the conception, the, the philosophical conception of what evil was? He had to, yes. What would you say is the, is the most basic definition at that point of what evil is? Not, not having God's will. Okay, would you agree, if I can kind of put your statements together, would you agree that a, a good definition of, of evil would be something other than what God is? Mm-hmm. I mean, God is the definition of good, is He not? Mm-hmm. God is good. He's the standard. Um, good is God. God is good. That's just what God is. Whatever God is, is good. He's the standard. He is what, what good means. So anything that's not like Him or opposed to Him or as a contrast to him, would be, by definition, evil. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. So do you think he had that concept? If God is all-knowing, wouldn't he know, at least conceptually, theoretically, what evil is? Yes. Okay. Now here is a view that I have kind of developed, and I got it from other people, I've kind of put my own twist to it. It seems to me that one possible reason, I don't know for sure this is the reason, only God knows, but maybe since God knew of evil conceptually, and since God brought into being all kinds of things, Augustine, Augustine used to say that God's the kind of God that delights in bringing the concept into the actual. He conceived of us. Weren't we a conception first? He had in his mind from all eternity the idea of of human. And flowers, and planets, and orbits. Don't you think? Didn't didn't that start in God's mind? So he had the the conception. He had had a blueprint. He had it all worked out in his mind and he brought it to pass. Does that make sense? Okay. So he also had the conception of evil. Now, he hates evil, whereas he loves flowers and rocks and people. He loves what he made. He said you know, he made it all and it was all good. Mm-hmm. But he also knew about evil as a conception. Maybe the reason why he allowed evil to become actual and not just remain conceptual is, is what do you think? What, what's one possibility why he let it become actual? So he could do what? Experience. Well, of course, he doesn't experience it in terms of being evil, right. but interacting with evil, he, he could experientially interact with it, and then do what? So he could rule over it, so that he could... Uh, Overcome it. Yes. And punish it. Mm-hmm. And judge it. That's just one... And I'm, again, I'm speculating, but that might be a philosophical answer for why God let evil become actual, not just remain conceptual. Mm-hmm. So he could actually deal with it in a tangible way and overcome it, and glorify himself in the process. But at the same time, yeah, pardon me a second, at the same time, and you have to kind of balance these things, otherwise you get extreme. At the same time, he let us, with our free will, whatever you think of free will, which is a complex issue, he let free will uh, be given to us, and he has so much respect for us as his creatures, we have so much value in being in his image, that whatever we chose... In this case, if it, if it was bad, he would respect that, even though it's a heavy choice, and we would be put into a very heavy consequence because he respects what we did. He, he takes our choice seriously. That's why he doesn't just uh, say, okay, you made a boo-boo, I'm just going to kind of get rid of it for you, help you out there. No, we have to live with the consequences because he respects our, our choice as a, a, a God-imaged being. And he lets us experience those awful consequences because that choice was taken seriously. God takes our choice for evil seriously. Mm-hmm. And so, did I have a comment earlier that was a comment or a hand? I thought I heard a comment. I want to let you ha- have your comment. Okay, so what else can you think of are possibilities for why God allowed evil? Do you want to answer philosophically or anything? Anything. Um, I think I heard him say something about experiencing evil. So if we experience evil, yeah. then when we fulfill that, then there, there's some sort of passion or pursuit that we want something else outside of evil. Okay, I think... If we're trying to pursue this good, then 
hey, I've experienced this evil now, I want to proceed. There has to be something more. So there's a, a need for God at that Yeah, I would agree. If I follow you, I, I'll kind of re, 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 rehash what you said. And I think it's what I, was, what I would say too. That in the Garden of Eden, uh, we had this test given to our ancestor, Adam and Eve. And, and of course, uh, the tree of life was one option. What's the other option? Knowledge of good and evil. Okay, notice that this is philosophical. It's knowledge of good and evil. Now, do you think if we had been obedient, we would have learned, he would have, God would have taught us the knowledge of good and evil? No. So that we, that we would have known about what evil is uh, conceptually? No. Well, some say no, some say yes. Uh, I would say he would have. But I don't know. I'm just speculating that we would have learned conceptually, like he knows conceptually, what evil is. He, he might say, okay, congratulations, you passed the test, uh, we'll dwell in fellowship forever. But um, he might say, okay, I'll teach you what evil is, so you know it conceptually. But I know you'll never do that because you passed the test. But maybe he wouldn't. Maybe you're right. And he wouldn't have even taught the concept of evil. But the knowledge of good and evil, now that we have chosen that, through our ancestor Adam and Eve, ancestors, since we did choose knowledge of good and evil, we not only know it, we've experienced it, and that has taught us something. Because knowledge does teach you something. What has it taught us, experientially? Wow, this is really bad. And I am so sorry that we ever did this. So, that will help us for eternity. To know not just conceptually, but experientially. Wow. I have no hesitation, I have no temptation to ever go that route again. What an awful mess that was. And thank you, Lord, you rescued us, and now we'll live in, in beauty, beauty. And we, now we know not just conceptually what evil, good and evil is, knowledge of good and evil, we know it experientially, and boy, I'm glad that that's behind us. So that may be one reason why he allowed it. Uh, and we David, a, I'm sorry, Lester, finish. Uh, and we have a deeper uh, sense of His love. Yeah, and, and a deeper sense of His love, like, like Mark was saying. We know what grace is, and that glorifies God and helps us. And David? Well, I think it's a, essentially an extension of what pretty much everybody said. That, that is that without creation, all His attributes are essentially potential and unexercised. Mm-hmm. And with creation... All of the various attributes are actually demonstrated. That's right. And so we can exercise love, we can exercise justice, we can exercise mercy, we can exercise indifference. And then all of the things that he is is actually born out. That's right. Yeah, we are kind of saying the same thing. That yeah, David said that by by creating and by allowing evil all his attributes can be actualized, not just be theoretical or conceptual, but we can actually experience all his attributes. Because there's evil, there's justice. Because there's evil, um, there's, the, there's the showing of grace in the midst of evil. So you would not see justice or grace without evil. So his attributes are, act, are actualized or, 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 or manifested in our experience because evil exists. That, that may have been another reason why God chose to allow it. So I, a lot of these things have to be kept all together. You've got to keep all these things together without going too far one way. And I think they all add up to uh, an explanation for why God allowed evil. But you still come up with a mystery at some level. We don't know all the reasons why he did. But those are. I just wanted to have a few things... Out in the out in the open about uh, why there's why why God would allow that. I have some things in your notes, but read that on your own. And there are other classes that go into that further. But for the sake of time, we have to go on to uh, other things. Let's uh, look on page nine e. Well, again, uh, don't look. <laughs> don't look. Okay, now I'm not sure if this is original with me. I have never seen anyone else uh, present this argument, but I'm sure it exists somewhere. Uh, I, I have a hard time believing that I'm the first person to think of this. So maybe you can tell me if you've read this somewhere else. Maybe you have, and I can find out where others are saying this. But since I've never heard or read anybody else do this, um, as far as I know, I only know of myself doing this as an, as an argument. And this is what I call the clothing argument to, to show that there is a moral lawgiver. 
that this has got to be done by somebody else probably a thousand times. I just haven't seen it. The clothing argument. Uh, what do you think that, that is, the clothing argument? How, how can clothing... Well, all of us have clothes on. And wherever you go on planet Earth, there's always clothing. Uh, I know of a tribe. I'm a former missionary, so I'm kind of interested in different cultures. I know of a tribe that to the, to the, to the, uh, to the typical observer, they look naked, but they're not. Um, this tribe I'm thinking of is in Brazil, I think. And they look totally naked. But in their culture, they're, they're clothed. Can you guess why? I'm, re I'm referring to the men. The men look naked, but they're not. The, the male sex organ has, without, without circumcision, what's called what? A foreskin. Okay, believe it or not, in that culture, that's called their, their clothing. And, and they, they have seen people ha that have been circumcised. They call them naked if they don't have their clothes on. So, to my knowledge, there's no culture on earth that by their definition, by the culture's definition, there's no culture ever, ever found that is totally naked. Now, it might be just a G-string, but that's clothing. Okay? In that culture, a G-string is clothing, and no G-string would, would be naked and shameful. So even in this culture that's very extreme, in Brazil, that only has four skins for the male, the females, I think, have a G-string, they call that clothing. They, they define that clothing in their culture. So they have a concept of clothing and nakedness. So 24,000 cultures, as far as we know, for 6,000 years of recorded history, all cultures, all the time, everywhere, all have clothing. Now, what's illogical about that um, in terms of the average tribe or culture in a hot climate? Most cultures have more clothing than just a G-string or a, fore, a foreskin. So in climates that are really hot, but they wear clothing, what's the ill logic with that? It doesn't lend itself to survival. If you're hot and sticky, the instinct is, the logic is, get those stupid clothes off, right? So why is it that in hot, sticky cultures, you don't find cultures that are totally naked? Why is it? Animals aren't ashamed of themselves. Yeah, animals are naked. They're not ashamed or, or guilty of being naked. So why is the human animal ashamed and they feel guilt, they feel awkward, they feel embarrassed instinctively to be naked? Even if, by our terms, they look naked, but, but in their culture, there's no such thing as a culture yet that by their definition is totally naked. What can explain that, that universal phenomenon? There's a universal feeling of guilt and shame if you're naked. But again, nakedness is a physical thing. But there's something going on there that's not physical. What part of being awkward, being naked, is not physical? Guilt and shame, for example. Is guilt and shame a physical thing? No. It's a moral thing. And morals are spiritual. They're invisible. Mm -hmm. So there's a universal law going on here. A law of shame to be naked. Even when it goes against logic. Because logic would be that if it's hot and sticky, you, t you don't have any clothes. And yet, people have this instinctive idea, i got to cover myself up. That has no credible explanation apart from one explanation. What is that? Same. That we are sinners, and the way we, we symbolize our, our being exposed before a judge is what? We use a, a clothing, a foreskin, a G-string, a, a, a feather, cowhide, something, to make us feel comfortable. So we use a physical symbol, instinctively, to help us with our moral dilemma. I don't know of any other explanation that, that can explain that as well as that. So once again, the scripture is, is ringing true in just the matter that everybody wears clothes, even uh, simple, simple clothing. So the last paragraph talks about that. Anybody ever heard that before or read that argument before? I should copyright that. Maybe I can make a book about that and have a contribution from yours truly. Okay, the last page. Very quickly. Paul Chamberlain has, has done a great job in a wonderful book he wrote that you don't have on your list, but 
It's a good book about ethics, morality. Oh, we'll have to just kind of read this together. A few highlights. From Paul Chamberlain, he has responded to the alternatives to explain moral law. If a moral God is not the reason for moral law, then what could be the alternative? And he shoots them down one by one. Okay, the first alternative is atheistic foundation. Atheistic foundation. He says, as his title, atheistic foundations cannot support objective morality. And he shows why. Look at the second sentence. Objective morality cannot credibly pop into being from amoral atoms. Once again, uh, it's, it's even worse than that. Um, morality is on which side? Spiritual. Which side? Are, which side are atoms on? Physical. Okay, atoms are physical. They're impersonal. So again, uh, the atheist foundation. How can uh, amoral, non-moral atoms produce moral oughts, which are values and so forth? Uh, now, this is an argument that C.S. Lewis used. He's also using as thirst implies the existence of water. So creaturely morality, the, the longing for justice, implies the existence of a creator who is moral, who will, who will eventually give justice. Although sinners should not want justice because and that means hell unless they repent. Okay, go to that, go to that uh, fourth dash. Fourth dash. Many atheistic justifications of morality are based on moral truisms. They call moral truisms as a result of coherence. Their answer for why there is universal morality is they say, well, that's just an aspect of coherence. It helps life become coherent or meaningful or clear. Things fitting together in a harmonious way. But here are four problems with that. Number one, the problem of... Who says? Who says this should be done, that should not be done? Who says? Coherence and harmony are important or right if there is no objective highest authority, such as God. You have to have a bottom line. You have to have someone who has the final say. Coherence isn't enough to satisfy that. Number two, how can coherence and harmony be explained if the origin of reality is chaos and disharmony? Number three, coherence alone is inadequate. It needs to be tied to and correspond with something objectively true. For example, compare Batman. The Batman story is coherent. But it's not true. There is no real Batman. But it's coherent. So how can coherency be enough to explain why we have this idea of morality? without tied to God. Therefore, correspondence is also needed. It needs to correspond to other things in life outside of just the, just the story itself. Number four, some moral views are coherent in themselves, but they conflict with other coherent moral views. If tribe A has a view of morality that's different from tribe B, then who decides who's right or wrong? They could kill each other unless you have a standard that they can both, both uh, obey. They, they might both be coherent. This tribe has their co coherent view that eating fish is the right thing. Over here, if you eat fish, we'll kill you. So you have to have some standard to decide who's right between both tribes without having total chaos. Okay, second, second alternative. What about the humanistic foundation? The humanistic foundation, Paul says, cannot support objective morality. Look at the first dash. Many humanistic justifications of morality are based on human nature as the foundation. Actions, with harmon actions which harmonize with human nature are good, and those that are not are evil. Here's the problem. 
But, number one problem, again, who says? Who says that's the way things should be? How many potential who-sayers are there on planet Earth right now? There are six billion potential who says. Well, who says you? Who says that? Well, who says I say? Well, I you don't, I don't care what you say. I say. Well, I don't care what you say. I, six billion. Yeah. Who's going to determine what's right and what's wrong if you have all these who says? You have to have one big who says. Mm-hmm. The standard. I say. And we know from experience that there is a standard because killing mothers is wrong in every culture. Mm-hmm. If it's your own mother. Yeah. Number two, how can this view objectively hope? I'm sorry, if, if that objectively judge between two or more conflicting views among humans. So once again, if you have whites against blacks or rich against poor, who's going to arbitrate? Who's going to judge? There has to be a final standard that cannot be handled by the humanistic foundation. Number three, even if something factually is, like whites usually rule others, and that's how it is through history, that does not necessarily make it superior or an ought. Uh, The white domination in history is an is. That doesn't make it an ought. It just means they had the power they did at the time. It does not mean that it's an ought. So he says, therefore, the last... um, Next to last line, therefore a bridge premise, underlined, is missing but needed. The is needs something. The is because of X, which the X means a moral standard, universal moral standard, uh, provides the ought. Is because of X provides the, provides the ought. But humanism is unable to objectively supply a needed bridge, bridge premise. Now, the next, next underlined problem or alternative is the evolutionary foundation. I think we've done enough about that to, without reading that with our lack of time. So I want to look at the, the next paragraph under the humanistic foundation, and we'll close uh, with that. Other humanists justify objective morality based on human need, or what's called in philosophy social contract, that we just agree as a tribe to have our own morality to keep our tribe together. So they say humans socially agree in what they need and aids to that are right and those that are not are wrong. But again, the problem is who says that human needs and agreements are so objectively important? What about those poor ants? Compare ants socially agreeing that if humans were removed, their needs would be met 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 better. In other words, who says we're more important than ants? If ants could make social contracts, you know, ants are pretty intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. They have cities. For every one human being, there's a million ants. Wow. And for every one person, there's a million ants. That's scary. But they have cities. They have leaders. They have servants. They have government. They have order. So what if they decided, and they outnumber us a million to one, what if they decided by social contract humans ought not be? We would say that that ought not be if they said that. But again, who says? Like above, number two, like above, if human group A, if human group A's social needs, for example, Nazis, clash with human group B's needs, such as Jews, then this foundation is unable to objectively judge between them. Number three, like above, the fact value is ought problem remains. Human need is X, but what objective reason Y justifies why X ought to be? Why is tribe Z's survival an ought? Or this is one I, this, this is one I keep using. Why is amoral atomic arrangement A, living human, upright human, better or an ought than a moral atomic arrangement B, dead human, horizontal human, in a grave. It's still a moral atomic arrangements. Four, what if group A, Aztecs, socially decide to kill, sacrifice some of their own people, group B? 
for the needs of the living. Does this make it right? How can this be objectively judged? And finally, this foundation is really subjective. It's just human subjective decision, not part of a universal moral law that we already know about. Is Calvin, is Calvin gone? Can someone tell if the camera's still on? Okay, so this is the end of our session. Thank you very much for, for taking this class. Can you turn it off? Is it off now? It'll go up on its own then. It's off. Was it on before? It wasn't in the wrong position. The red light is still on. It was on. Okay. Um, okay, time's up. Uh, question, Mario? Not a question. Uh, maybe a statement. I, I guess I should be right. In our class, you did a wonderful job. Well, thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. You know, um, this is this is a hard class. It's hard for hard for me, hard for you. So this is a hard class. So uh, thank you, thank you for being patient with this camera thing. If the camera had not been on, we would have had a lot more interaction, which would have helped. And we would have been on page twelve. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, thank you for that uh, compliment. But uh, it's it's been a tough week for me as well as you. This this is this is hard stuff. But thank you for your part. Um, look at the last paragraph. If you read your, I mean, not if, when you read your book by Peter Kreeft, you have to, and I hope you will anyway, look, look at the next to last line where it says, Note, note, the remaining questions, lessons in our philosophical journey will now necessarily move in a more religious direction. Compare the humanly, no, humanly known ceiling in philosophy. Uh, you know, we have a ceiling of limitation. The mind cannot go very far. So we have this humanly, humanly known ceiling in philosophy and we have the penetration in Christian religion due to divine revelation. So let me just draw one quick little figure here. The, yeah, the way we have to conclude this class is like this. Calvin, uh, he turned it off.